I'm here today with Professor John Stauffer from Harvard University. Uh, Professor Stauffer is Professor of English, American Studies, and African American Studies at Harvard. He writes and lectures on the Civil War era, anti-slavery, social protest movements, and photography. And Professor uh, was, was my teacher a few years ago. I took uh, his Civil War from Nat Turner to Birth of a Nation uh, when I was undergrad. And uh, I have his book here called Giants, which was a, which a co-biography on uh, Douglas and Lincoln. And Professor, thank you very much for your time. I know it's a busy busy time of the year now with finals and papers coming up, but thank you for, uh, for reconnecting today. Sure, it's great to see you again. <laughs> so as I was telling you, I'm, I'm teaching uh, U.S. history this year, and we're right in the, uh -huh. we're leading up to the Civil War, so we're talking about the impending crisis, and it's actually a perfect time for, for me to talk to you um, to just get some of your insights on what was really happening in the United States leading up to the Civil War? Because to be honest, it's it's sort of overwhelming for me as a teacher. I teach 11th and 12th grade, and uh, there's so much going on in the country that it's, it's hard to grab hold of something specific to talk about in my classes. Um, so the impending crisis, what, you know, what comes to mind for you that is leading up to the Civil War? Slavery. <laughs> That's the impending crisis is really all about slavery. The uh, Compromise of 1850 uh, really radicalized Northerners and alienated Southerners, uh, particularly with the Fugitive Slave Law. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, uh, which was part of the Compromise of 1850. Other aspects were uh, California entering the Union as a uh, free state, which was a huge uh, victory for anti-slavery Northerners. But the Fugitive Slave Law was significant because it required uh, every Northerner to participate in the roundup of a suspected fugitive. So essentially what it did is it, it made every Northerner no longer able to wash his or her hands from slavery. Everyone in the North in the free states was implicated. Uh, and so there had been a, before 1850s, many if not most Northerners might have said, well, you know, I don't like slavery, but it's not my issue. I want to focus on my job or my work. Uh, whereas after the, after the uh, compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law, you could no longer wash your hands from the problem you were implicated because the Fugitive Slave Law uh, stipulated that anyone could be, um, could be uh, deputized and forced to round up a suspected fugitive in your community. Um, and so essentially that forced people to take a stand that they could no longer sit on the fence. Uh, and uh, th that uh, then culminated uh, um, with the Dred Scott decision of 1857 and the Dred Scott decision um, what is the most uh, infamous Supreme Court decision even today uh, in American history because it uh, uh, Roger Taney, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, emphasized three things. One is that um, blacks can never be citizens uh, and that their natural uh, condition is that of slaves, uh, which led Southerners to begin to uh, to enslave free blacks in the South. Uh, and uh, the second um, the second um, theme that the Supreme Court, uh, in a majority opinion, decided uh, was that uh, that. Um, it was unconstitutional to prohibit the spread of slavery into any territory, um, which meant that um, that slaves could uh, slavery uh, could exist in the, throughout the North. Um, and the third prong of the Dred Scott decision uh, was uh, that 
uh, if I'm a Mississippi master, the slave owner, I can take my property to any state in the union and it remains my property. Essentially, it's it argued that slavery is now nationalized. Um, so if I'm a Mississippi planner and I, I bring my um, enslaved people to New York City and set up a factory with slave labor, it's my property. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that absolutely outraged Northerners and, and a lot of scholars and um, a lot of scholars have argued that after the Dred Scott decision, civil, civil war was inevitable. So right now I'm, and I I'm talking about the Missouri Compromise a little bit, which I know gets repealed yeah. after Kansas and Nebraska are yeah. added to the Union. Yes, yes. yes. So the first, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act um, follows the Compromise of 1850, and um, which is the 1854, which it, uh, it, it repeals the Missouri Compromise which opens the way for slavery to spread in all territories. And that's what prompted um, the uh, Dred Scott, to, or the majority opinion of Dred Scott. Um, and uh, so it, it was, yeah, in, beginning with the Compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Law, the nation was really um, di profoundly divided. It was really two nations. Uh, and uh, the degree of violence um, between anti-slavery and uh, slave owners was profound um, and it, it, it radicalized uh, the United States in, in, in ways that led directly to civil war. And would you say that the bleeding Kansas and the violence that broke out in that territory of the United States, was that had the war pretty much begun already when when that violence occurred? Yeah, so a lot of I mean, I, and when I teach uh, and I've written on this, the, uh, the the war, I mean, the war really begins um, if if the Civil War is about the status of blacks in the United States, it begins even earlier. We could go back to that. But in with a with a Kansas Nebraska Act opening, um, all northern territories to slavery, um, immediately southerners and northerners go to Kansas, which is still the Kansas territory, which is still a territory, and there's guerrilla warfare in Kansas. And southerners send uh, thousands of um, men to Kansas with guns and uh, weapon, other weapons, and there's horrible um, guerrilla warfare in Kansas. Uh, and in fact, uh, John Brown and uh, his number of his sons go to Kansas to try to make Kansas a free state. Southerners from all over go to Kansas. Uh, it's a ma it's a horrible, just vicious guerrilla warfare. From um, shortly after the Kansas Nebraska Act passes. Uh, in uh, 1854 until, um, I mean, through the, the official war and when Southerners secede. Um, the, the degree, it's just that, the, that from 1854 until 1861, the violence uh, is um, centered um, around in Kansas and in a few other states. And after um, the bombing of Fort Sumner, the violence spreads throughout um, the country. So one of the things I, I also teach a course here at Gilman on leadership. And uh, John Brown is such a fascinating character to me just as a leader, but also because Harper's Ferry is, I think it's only an hour away. I've, I've hiked there a few times and right, right, it's just such right. an interesting history. But I'd love to talk about John Brown as a leader and what qualities really allowed him to rebel in this violent way? So Brown was deeply religious. Uh, he was, he believed that um, the God, Jesus were um, eminent and indwelling. Um, he was, he believed that, um, that uh, God and Jesus could affect the affairs of the world. Uh, he 
failed in most occupations that he did. Um, but from the time he was a young man, he was uh, he recognized the equal humanity of all people, um, including blacks and women. And uh, from the time he was quite young, in fact, he had there was an incident when he was a, essentially a teenager where he witnessed um, an enslaved person being brutally whipped, which was a, an important um, moment in his life. Um, but he always considered himself a, uh, a, a warrior trying to destroy slavery. He became um, a fairly close friend of Frederick Douglass. Um, he, schemed, um, he, he schemed to destroy slavery uh, beginning um, in the late 1840s. Um, in fact, he, he articulated a, a, what he called an underground pathway. He ho hoped to uh, use some um, uh, abolitionist whites and blacks and uh, make raids into um, plantations in the slave states and uh, send them up the Allegheny and the um, into the Adirondacks and then Canada to freedom. Uh, and he hoped that there were, he could um, he could liberate enough um, enslaved people that it would um, that it would send a message to the United to people in the United States to free slavery everywhere that that plan that's and he called it his uh uh the subterranean pathway pa uh, plan really never got off the ground and that's when he decided to um raid uh, raid the, the the largest federal arsenal in the country which is harper's ferry um take um take the over the arsenal with the weapons and essentially spark civil war um, which uh, he attempted to do, was captured, was tried and convicted of treason and executed. But his uh, raid was uh, uh, the best way to understand John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry is to say that John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry was a analogous to 9-11 uh, of the 21st century. Um, it transformed people's understanding and everyone had to take a stand you were either um for uh the abolitionists for anti-slavery for john brown or you were uh for slavery um and uh in fact the john brown's raid um led directly uh to the civil war and some scholars see it as really the beginning the, the kansas the guerrilla warfare in Kansas and Brown went to Kansas. In fact, Brown's most notorious act in Kansas is that, um, is that he and um, uh, I think it's seven sons and sons-in-law were uh, in Kansas and um, in Lawrence, Kansas was a major um, free state uh, anti-slavery stronghold and it had been essentially torched and almost burned to the ground by uh, Southerners um, who came to Kansas uh, to fight for slavery in Kansas. And Brown retaliated by um, going into uh, a community in, in the middle of the night, pulling out the um, all of the men, the father and sons, and, uh, and murdering them with... Um, with broadswords um it really a gruesome bloody um murder brown was never implicated at that point um in his murders at kansas his retaliatory murders in kansas um but when he was captured at harper's ferry then news came out and it became national news that he had uh, committed these murders in kansas and it was uh it truly was the uh the, probably the major spark of the Civil War. And in fact, um, in the wake of John Brown's raids, uh, Stephen Douglas, who was the Democratic, um, uh, one of the leading senators uh, from Il U.S. senators from Illinois, uh, Lincoln's nemesis, uh, Stephen Douglas, um, Stephen Douglas um, was a front runner 
for the presidency in 1860. Um, and uh, because of John Brown's raid, Southerners decided they or concluded that they could no longer trust any Northern Democrat. And uh, so when Stephen Douglas was ran for president in, um, in the Democratic president in 1860, uh, in the convention, Southerners walked out. And they said, we cannot trust Stephen Douglas. We cannot trust any Democratic Northerner. So they created their own, uh, their own Southern Democratic Party. Uh, in which John Breckinridge was the uh, Southern Democratic candidate, Stephen Douglas was the Northern Democratic candidate, and uh, the split. So the, the 1860 election was a four-way race between a Southern Democrat and Northern Democrat. Lincoln is running as the second um, Republican candidate in the Republican Party, which was founded in the wake, uh, in, in the immediate wake of uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, w it, it was the first national party um, in, in which anti-slavery was the central platform. And uh, Southerners made it clear that if a Republican had been, if a Republican were elected president, Southerners would walk out. Um, and they, they threatened to do it in 1856 uh, when John C. Fremont, who was the very first Republican candidate um, ran for president, and uh, when Lincoln was elected, the very next day, South Carolina announced its secession convention. Um, so it highlights the 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 radical, profound split in the nation um, that uh, is a result in part of John Brown's raid. So I've been reading a little bit of uh, Lincoln and Douglas debates and. In, in their debates with each other, Lincoln doesn't, he doesn't take, I mean, I guess this is a little bit earlier from the period that we're, we're talking about now, but right. he doesn't take a, um, like, total anti-slavery position then, but then in 1860 he does, and, and that's what the Republican Party represented at that time. Yeah, in his debates with Stephen Douglas, he's... Uh, yeah, he's um, he's running against Stephen Douglas for um, uh, for uh, uh, he's running against Stephen Douglas in 1858 uh, for the um, U.S. Senate, um, and uh, he is very clear about anti-slavery, um, meaning that he is, and he's firm on this, Lincoln. Uh, emphasizes in his debates that he uh, advocates, he embraces the Republican Party platform that says that it should not, that slavery should not spread or, um, into uh, free states. Um, and uh, Stephen Douglas and into free state and, and into free territory. Stephen Douglas's basic platform is um, popular sovereignty, meaning that settlers, anyone, all of the settlers who go into a new territory can decide for themselves, regardless of how far north the territory is or not, can decide for themselves what, whether to vote slavery up or down, which mean, which would mean that the mid, like a place like Kansas or a place like what's now North Dakota, it doesn't matter how far north it is, that it could, it, be, it could be a slave state if the settlers, the people in that state in applying for admission to statehood as a territory could choose uh, uh, if they vote, if they if issued a petition to enter the Union as a, a slave state, they could no matter how north, far north they were, which is which is uh, reflects the significance of repealing the Missouri Compromise. Mm -hmm. And so Lincoln was was very clear in um, arguing that the um, what, he, what Lincoln called squatter sovereignty rather than popular sovereignty uh, that was um, not a uh, he re he repudiated that vision for the nation and 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 very much believed uh, in restoring the Missouri Compromise line the thirty six thirty parallel. So that there was a line above which 
states would be free and below which slaves would states would be slave. Um, and, and, you know, of course, uh, um, uh, Stephen Douglas, as I said, um, advocated a popular sovereignty um, position, which would have allowed, you know, the northernmost states to be slave states. And that became a, a huge um, wedge that um, ultimately led to the um, four-way race in the 1860 election, which enabled uh, the election of Lincoln. Had it been a two-way race, had had John Brown never lived, had John Brown never um, uh, taken over Harper's Ferry, it probably would have been a, a traditional rep a Republican um, and uh, Republican uh, versus a Democratic election in 1860. And um, if you just run the numbers in terms of the the um, the uh, the other two parties, the the Southern Democratic John Breckinridge and John Bell was trying to resuscitate the old Whig Party. Uh, those votes would have gone um, to uh, those votes would have gone to Stephen Douglas, and he would have been elected president in 1860. Um, and, uh, so that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> when, when Lincoln becomes president, war's breaking out. Why does he, why does he care more about, I mean, we know why it's important today, but why is preserving the union so important to him rather than just curtailing slavery and keeping it in the South? Or, or at that point, was it too late to keep slavery in the in the south like he knew then that it was more important to preserve the union yes so when lincoln was elected um as i said the first the the day after lincoln's election south carolina announces its secession convention when he takes the oath of office um seven states have already seceded and um, others, the north, the upper South is threatening to secede, and Maryland, a lot, a lot of Marylanders uh, want to secede, and Lincoln knows as you know this new incoming president, if Maryland becomes a, a, if Maryland leaves the Union, and becomes part of this new Confederacy, Washington D.C. is surrounded by rebels. And there's no way that you're going to win the war if Maryland, um, because if Maryland goes to, uh, it becomes part of the Confederacy. So Lincoln's Lincoln's goal in his first um, his first inaugural address is to convince the Upper South not to secede. So he's it's a comparatively conservative inaugural address because his main goal is to say, if the Upper South secedes that's the, you know that's it that's it there's nothing we can do um and uh so his main goal is to uh prevent to, to try to prevent war to try to prevent the upper south from seceding and uh to buy time he thinks that you know there's a, this is a revolutionary moment just let people calm down and he hopes that uh, that um, that the states who have that have seceded will realize that it, that was a bad idea and they'll uh, return to the union. Obviously, that doesn't happen. Um, Northerners, and especially abolitionists in the North, are outraged by his inaugural address because his he's really he's his address is geared toward the Upper South and toward the South and trying to prevent a civil war. Um, and obviously, you know, that doesn't that doesn't work. And in fact, after he gives his inaugural address, he goes to the White House. And one of the first pieces of paper is that Southerners have already um, taken over federal um, forts. Uh, and so they're U United States forts that the Southerners, the Southerners have claimed for themselves. And one of the forts is Fort Sumner. Uh, which is the northernmost um, uh, uh, federal property that the South is control of. And there's some 
Union, um, United States military at Fort Sumner. They're out of food. They're out of water. They need help. And so Robert Anderson is the commander of Fort Sumner. And one of the first um, memos he has when he, after delivering the inaugural address, is this memo from uh, Robert Anderson saying, "Hey, we're out of food. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have to surrender if you don't send a boat of food and supplies for us." And so Lincoln, I think it was a brilliant move. I mean, he has a, he has a choice. He can make he can start bombing Fort Sumner, and he's then implicated for starting the war. Um, he can do nothing, which means the Southerners are going to take Fort Sumner and arrest and imprison. Um, all of the Union officers there, or he can make the South um, start the war by, which is what he does, is he sends a note to um, Jefferson Davis. I mean, the Confederacy's already been formed. Uh, so he sends a note to this new president of the uh, conf this new Confederate States, Jefferson Davis, saying, um, our men are at Fort Sumner, they're out of food, um, they're out of water. Heads up, I'm just sending a, um, a, sh a boat with food and, and water. No arms. This is not a, uh, a, a boat that's, uh, or a ship that uh, is designed to um, spark a uh, battle. It's just to provide um, the United States uh, uh, armed forces with um, food and water. When the boat arrives, you know, Southerners bomb Fort Sumner for two days, and um, <laughs> that's what starts the war. Um, and and the John Brown's raid was is is important because um, a number of leading um, pro-slavery Southerners who want a separate slave-owning union um, send uh, one of the things that Brown brings with him to Harper's Ferry are these pikes that he things he can use in the mountains in, in a form of warfare. And he sends um, these pikes or these spears to every um, congressman saying compliments to John Brown, um, and uh, which is, is a way of suggesting that the, the, the Northerners are really the aggressors. And the upshot is that um, I think Lincoln's um, first move of forcing uh, the uh, South to start the war was uh, a brilliant one because um, in doing so, uh, the bombing of Fort Sumner um, sent a message to the North saying that um, the abolitionists and the anti-slavery, the Republican Party was right, that Southerners really don't care about the union all southerners care about is expanding slavery that's their only concern mm -hmm. they don't they don't define them themselves as american they define themselves as slave owners and and um in one sense uh that's accurate because at the time from a broader global perspective the rest of the world was abolishing slavery as early as 1850, the United States is the largest slave-owning nation on earth. More slaves in the United States than any other place in the entire world. The rest of the world is abolishing slavery, and, and the United States is trying to expand slavery. In well, fact, in the decade of the decade of 1850, Southerners try to take over land in Central and South America for slavery. They want to expand slavery. They want to create an empire for slavery. They raid, uh, they send some men into Nicaragua without the support of the United States government trying to take over Nicaragua, what's now Nicaragua, for the United States. So there, so in a sense, you could say the Southerners are the true conservatives. The best way that I've characterized it to students is that it would be it would be analogous to um, the debates over um, gay marriage. You know, 1970, 1980, you know, the idea of sanctioning gay marriages was seen as absurd. It was it was horrible. It was sinful. It was just outrageous. And suddenly, because of the um, the very effective um, uh, activism and protest and 
uh, and humanitarian um, efforts on the parts of um, uh, a large number of Americans that changes dramatically, which allows um, gay marriage to pass. Um, and uh, so there's a there's a and a similar wave occurred at that time, and it's in, uh, in large part because of the new Republican Party, which is the first national party in the country in which anti-slavery is its central platform, and all Republicans, including Lincoln, emphasized that. Um, slavery is an evil. It's a moral as well as uh, as well as national as well as uh, it's an evil in every way, um, and that is uh, that is very effective, um, especially by saying I'm anti-slavery. I'm not going to use violence. I'm not going to try to end it right away. Throughout his debates with Stephen Douglas, Lincoln was saying, you know, in my in in my vision, slavery should end gradually. He said it, it, it at one in one of the debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858. He says uh, when Douglas pressed him on when the ultimate extinction of slavery would occur, Lincoln responded. I said he said in not less than 100 years. So Lincoln it comes across as a as a as a liberal rather than a radical. Doesn't, in fact, he, that says, would, he says it in his inauguration too, right? He says, my intention is not to like, get rid of slavery in that's the That's exactly right. But in his debates with Stephen Douglas, when Stephen Douglas says, when do you envision this, the end of slavery? What, you know, wh what's your long-term, what's your vision for you hate slavery? Are you going to try to destroy it right now? And Lincoln says, no, it should end gradually, very gradually. He said... Um, it, he said it. It, it will. Uh, my, I envision the end of slavery in not less than 100 years. That would put the, that would have put the end of slavery uh, in 1958 at the earliest. Mm -hmm. So that's a fairly mild response. You know, that's not going to alienate or outrage a lot of people. It's not a revolutionary response. Whereas the abolitionists, I mean, one of the characteristics of abolition is like slavery is, a, is, is, is inhumane um, and it should be ended immediately. Lincoln's like, let's, it's very gradual. Let's just be patient. <laughs> so Charles Sumner is an interesting character. And I, I read that you might be working on a, a project with him um, I am. I'm finishing a biography of Sumner. What, what's what's that experience been like writing about Sumner and learning about his you know whole life? So Sumner was um, he. One of the reasons I'm writing it is that um, Sumner grew up in the black neighborhood of Boston. He was friends with many of the black leaders in the United States who lived in Boston, um, and uh, it was the north slope of Beacon Hill. He, his father and his family did not have much money, which is why he grew up there. Um, and the black Bostonians were not only leaders in Boston, but many of the national leaders. And uh, so from the time he was really a young boy, um, the, it, he basically grew up believing and and embracing the idea of racial equality that all humans are of one blood in god's eyes all humans are equal um and uh and that was um that was essentially ingrained in him from birth at one point he tells in fact wendell phillips um as a young boy as a teenage boy was one of Wendell Phillips grew up very wealthy. Wendell Phillips was another major national abolitionist, but as a young boy, he was um, he was very only very he was very racist. He and his buddies, his other whites, would throw rocks and beat up the black boys in um, Beacon Hill. Wendell Phillips lived in the West Slope, which is a very wealthy part of Boston. Sumner grows up in the North Slope, which was. Uh, most uh, it was it was a largely it was a not it was a a non-white majority neighborhood or community um and wendell phillips uh he has a a conversion experience recognizing the air the wrongs that he had committed when he was a young boy someone like sumner or sumner he 
from the time he was he could remember he was opposed to slavery. His father um, was a bastard child. Um, he they didn't have much money, uh, um, and his father went to San Domingo um, during the Haitian Revolution and toasted and supported uh, Toussaint Louverture and Boyer uh, in Santo Domingo and uh, was one of the his um, one of his um, most memorable experiences. His father was a became the sheriff of um, of uh, Boston. Uh, so it was a kind of plebeian position. And the upshot is that Sumner, um, he, it, he was a, essentially a scholarship kid who went to Harvard, um, loved the law in part because he felt that the law could um, destroy slavery. Um, and uh, was he also wanted to be a writer. Um, Sumner was a very close friend of Longfellow. He's a close friend of Whittier, the two preeminent poets in the United States. Um, he was uh, a friend of Melville, a friend of Hawthorne, a friend of major writers and read their works. Uh, and he was encouraged and asked to run for the Senate actually um, by, um, uh, by uh, Whittier, John Greenleaf Whittier, who was a, a Massachusetts um, Quaker um, uh, politician as well as poet and essentially convinced Sumner that he could both, he could, if he were, a, if he ran for the U.S. Senate uh, and was a U.S. Senator, he could still be a writer. Um, and I think, I think Whittier was being disingenuous. He just wanted his friend to be elected. And the upshot is that he was, Sumner was elected in, um, 18, uh, 1854, and, and uh, he, from the beginning, he was a, um, or 1850, and from the beginning, he was, uh, he was very outspoken in recognizing um, the degree to which, for Sumner, he recognized that slavery itself is a state of war, because slavery depends upon violence or the threat of violence. And to um, to commit violence against another human being is to get to commit violence against God, uh, and you know slave owners were outraged by that understanding, uh, and it's what led to um, his caning. He exposed um, the inhumanity of Southerners. He exposed the degree to which, and Sumner, uh, more than probably any other senator or congressman recognized that southerners really did not care about the united states they didn't they had no they had no faith or loyalty in the union they had faith and loyalty in slavery that's it and he in a sense he outed them um and uh stephen douglas and um and uh the uh south carolinian were um both spearheading the kansas nebraska act and uh, Sumner was did not pull any punches about exposing the the um, the anti-democratic nature of uh, their attempt to just transform the nation into a slave nation. Andrew Butler, who's the senator of South Carolina, was also was a leading politician. And Sumner uh, was a very good writer, a very good orator. And he uh, just excoriated Butler and uh, Stephen Douglas and uh, Southerners at this time. The best way to understand the South is that it was a feudal society. It was a society, it was a feudal society and with a rigid hierarchy. So essentially it was similar to feudal Europe in which the um, in the South and, and virtually every Frederick Douglass, every former slave, emphasized that Southerners do not care about the Union, they care only about slavery. And the, the center of power in the United States was, this, was the master of a plantation, the slave owner of a plantation. Um, and that, um, that the, the laws of a state 
could would be superseded by whatever the slave owner could do. Um, and uh, Sumner recognized the 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 undemocratic um, feudal nature of the South and exposed them and and uh, he uh, embarrassed uh, Andrew Butler uh, other Southerners and it prompted Preston Brooks who was a distant cousin of uh, Andrew Butler to almost murder Sumner on the Senate floor uh, but it was a period in which 1850 there were a large number of fights in, in uh, Congress, mostly uh, instigated by Southerners, because Southerners loved to fight. Um, there were, Southerners believed in this kind of feudal system of if someone criticized you, you were dishonored, and to uh, defend your sense of honor, you needed to fight that person. I, uh, um, that's interesting. I just watched, there was a video a couple weeks ago of the, I think it was the Senate conversation and one person was threatening to get into a cage fight with another guy and Bernie Sanders yeah. is bang, yeah. you know, yeah. insane. Yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that still exists. And you still see it in some communities where one sense of honor has been threatened. And so they, they, the, the solution is to fight. And uh, so Preston Brooks, instead of he felt that in in the in the Southern Code of Honor, if someone was um, your subordinate and not your equal, you horsewhipped him. So essentially, Preston Brooks treated Sumner like a slave rather than like a uh, an equal, and so he he almost killed Sumner. Um, in fact, Sumner was lucky to be able to walk again, um, and uh, it took him. You know, he was out of commission he was caned in um in 18 uh mid 1850s and he does doesn't return 1856 and he doesn't return to the senate and he's not he doesn't recover until or doesn't return until 1860 um and even when he returns he has to walk with a cane he's never the same again he was never the same um, but he was he was one of the leading uh, proponents um, of uh, the, who highlighted the degree to which uh, Southerners did not care about the United States. They had no love in the, of, for the Union. They had no love for the United States. They had love only for slavery. Yeah, there's a great there's a great statue on campus of Sumner right in, in, in Harvard Square. Um, yeah, right in Harvard Square. <laughs> well, I'm excited yeah. for your book, Professor and. Maybe I could ask you one more question today. Um, I appreciate, again, your time. Um, this class that you're teaching now about the Civil War today uh, and whether we're still fighting it, I, I, I haven't talked to you about what that class is about, but one of the things that I try to do in my class with my history students, again, they're in 11th grade, and some of them are really into history, and others, you know, it will take some years before they start to understand the importance of history, but I think my goal is a as a high school teacher right now is to just get them to care about the importance of learning about the civil war and learning about Abraham Lincoln and, you know, recognizing the courage right. that Frederick Douglass had. Um, but for you, you know, you're teaching this class and, and thinking about that question, like why should, why should students care so much about this period of time and maybe the echoes that it has in the world today? They should care because uh, one is that the United States remains somewhat fragile. There have been just in recent years um, efforts to um, for states to secede. California um, had a Cal exit. Um, they proposed to secede from the United States and establish their its their own nation and they, this. Um, program called Cal Exit, which was spearheaded by a Russian. <laughs> and uh, it almost came to a, a, um, a vote um, in which Californians would vote for leaving the United, be, becoming a separate state, a separate nation and leaving the United States. Uh, and the reason the vote um, 
it never well there was a vote but it never went anywhere is because the leader the head of the cal exit movement was a russian himself and you know if you're russia and you're threatened by the united states the easiest way to gain power over the united states is to break up the united states <laughs> And as you know, you and most of your students probably know, there's now a movement movement in Texas. Um, the the uh, Texas, to, the number of Texans want to secede from the United States today, um, and become their own its own uh, nation, uh, and uh, that kind of you know. So essentially, the whole concept of secession. Um, is uh, is still with us. And as Lincoln said in his first inaugural address, that, I mean, one of the main points he emphasized is that secession is the essence of anarchy. Um, it's the essence, and he's accurate, that if you're a nation, a nation state, and you just, you, you think, and you argue that, you, that anyone can walk away, um, that nation is, is doomed. It's, Completely, um, and uh, and it reflects the fragility of democracy. A, a democracy depends upon the electorate having a sense of humility because people have passionate views on things. I mean, today we're the United States is still very divided, and there and a lot of it is based on these passionate views. And if um, you you allow your passions to take over your sense of um, the, a nation, you know, the nation isn't going to survive. Um, it will not survive. Uh, and uh, I think that's um, a, a democracy is innately unstable for that reason, I would say. Um, and uh so there's and and one of the things that horrified me and many others is when uh, President Trump, after losing uh, the election in 2020 and just um, ignoring the the vote and saying and wanting to um, essentially commit he committed treason and tried to um, and tried to uh, rem tried to remain in as president of the United States. And he had said a number of things as president um, that was that would have destroyed democracy. For example, he celebrated uh, um, Xi the, in the essentially dictator um, of China by saying he 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 wanted to, you know, he, that he he would he would like to be he would like the United States to have a leader like um, Xi. Uh, and uh, he was just, he, he was not, a, he was not, he did not believe, does not believe in democracy. So one of the, one of the reasons why any democracy, including the United States, is comparatively fragile is that democracy requires the electorate, people who vote, to have a sense of humility, that you can be very passionate about, and you know, this is my vision of the United States. And so I'm voting for this vision. And if I lose, you need to be willing to, you need to have enough humility to accept that loss, to say, okay, I'm a minority, I have lost. And, but I still, I still believe in and love the United States, or at least believe in. And if you're arrogant, if you have, if the, your ego is such that you're too arrogant and you say, if I lose, I'm walking out, I'm leaving, democracy's dead in the water. Democracy requires um, a sense of humility. And democracy also requires uh, a sense of um, literacy um, in which the electorate needs to be able to distinguish between a statesman and a con man. Uh, and if you can't make that distinction, uh, that nation is in is is in deep trouble. Well, Professor, thank you very much for uh, for your time today. Um, hope you have a great holiday. Best of luck with your book. Um, thank you. I'm excited to read that. I'm flipping through this one again now. So, okay. thank you. So uh, where are you in your um, Where are you in your course? 
We're I'm trying to get to the election of 1860 before our midterm, which is in two two weeks. So okay. um, I'm I'm at the impending crisis. We're talking about manifest destiny a little bit and right. Right. James Polk and uh, yeah. yeah. So it's it's I'm gonna have my students listen to this episode of the podcast and uh, and add some to their notes. That's great. That's great. Uh, uh, are you having them? Are, are you having them read um, any of Lincoln's speeches or of Douglas' speeches? Are you having them read Lincoln's inaugural or first inaugural? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating address. <laughs> I mean, Lincoln is. It's uh, you know, abolitionist hated this address because he's trying to. He's trying to buy time. He's trying to prevent the Upper South from seceding. Um, he's comparatively sympathetic to Southerners and just in trying to prevent, um, encourage the seceded states to return to the Union. Um, and abolitionists hate it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's a it's a very it's a very subtle speech. I mean, Lincoln. I mean, the reason I teach this co- this course on Frederick Douglass and Lincoln and is I think they're two of the preeminent self-made men in the country but they're also among the greatest writers and it highlights the degree to which literacy I think is just foundational is crucial for any kind of democracy and um, Lincoln and Douglass you know neither, neither one of them had any formal education um, and they they learned to become among the greatest orators and writers of the 19th century um, because of, you know, a a handful of major canonical works that they read. Um, And, uh, and I, I, I mean, Lincoln at his best, I mean, and as a, as a writer and speaker is, is, is stunning, Mm -hmm. is brilliant. I mean, Douglas is more consistently, I think, um, uh, a brilliant writer and orator. Um, but that's partly because Lincoln liked to get into a lot of um, very narrow, detailed um, political arguments that are only interesting to politicians, whereas Douglas is... is um, has um, more flexibility in um, reaching a broad audience. Let me ask you uh, one more question. What was it like being a consultant on the Django movie? It's one of my favorite movies. Oh, uh, it was, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, Tarantino, the, um, the script was, I was amazed at Tarantino's, um, knowledge and sophistication um, of uh, the past of America, of American history and culture. Um, so, for example, um, it was crucial that uh, the um, it was a, a German immigrant, I guess, who was uh, the doctor, one of the lead characters, who was a, becomes a friend of uh, the um, of Django. Um, that was crucial because it had he been someone born and raised in the United States, he would have needed to spend the entire film explaining why he wasn't racist. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're a German immigrant, I mean, it was true. German immigrants tend as a group, they, because there, there were basically no blacks in Germany. They came to the United States and they're shocked at the, at the, at the rabid racism of the United States. And so Germans as a group were, among the staunchest of anti-slavery advocates or abolitionists because they had no experience with that kind of um, just open brass prejudice. And that's it. That's one of um, just a number of uh, your really crucial moves that uh, he made. Mm. Um, so essentially I, th- I thought the script, I read the script. I mean, my main, job was to give him um, images that were historical images and 
uh, that um, he could use in the film. And, and he would ask me questions like, you know, in the South, um, if you're having a dinner party, what would they serve? What would the table setting look like? Um, and so that was fun and easy for me to give him a bunch of details <laughs> about. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much, Professor. It's uh, it's great to reconnect and talk a little bit about history. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> thank you.